So I'm just going to start out with a, a land acknowledgement. In the spirit of truth and reconciliation, Nature Alberta acknowledges that the land we know as Alberta resides within Treaty 6, 7, and 8, as well as portions of Treaties 4 and 10, and is the ancestral and traditional territory of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We have a responsibility to care for these lands and waters and to honor the history and culture of those who have been here for generations. Thank you so much for joining me for the IBA Caretakers 2023 update. I'm excited to have everyone together and, and um, learn more about what's going on and, uh, and connect. Let me get my next button to work for me here. There we go. So just a quick summary of, of what we're going to go over today. I will give you a brief overview of Nature Alberta's role and the resources we have available to IBA caretakers in our current processes. And then I'll hand it over to Molly Bradford here today, joining us from Birds Canada. And Molly will give an overview, update, and case study, I believe, of key biodiversity area transition, specifically in the Alberta region. And, and, and then we'll open it up for questions for Molly. And while, while we have her valuable time here today, so we can ask her all of those um, exciting questions we have about that process. And then I'd like to have a round table of updates for anyone who's interested in sharing stories or um, has questions and updates about their um, important bird area that they volunteer with. And any um, I'll be interested to hear any ways that Nature Alberta could also support you in the future in these roles. Nature Alberta is the regional coordinator for the important bird area caretaker program. There is a history kind of outlined on one of our web pages under explore um, nature. Uh, there is a current need for bird surveys at important bird areas across the province to fill in data gaps to transition our current important biodiversity and bird areas to the new key biodiversity area system. And Molly will be talking more about that. Our IBA caretakers in Alberta take on many different forms. Some of our important bird and biodiversity areas are monitored by organizations like um, bird observatories who are actually monitoring um, migration and nesting birds on a very intensive type of surveying format and even banding birds and releasing them and things like that. So that's kind of like the highest level of monitoring and, and impact there. And, um, and then we have naturalist clubs who um, are caretaking some of these IBA areas. And we also have amazing volunteers who are just individuals who are familiar with the area or keen to go out and volunteer to contribute to the conservation and monitoring of those areas and and um, submit their bird surveys and things like that. So those are kind of varying varying levels and and we greatly appreciate everybody's contribution is absolutely um, important for monitoring our natural spaces and species in Alberta. So I want to thank everyone here today for for all of the things that you do for nature in Alberta. We have resources available for current and prospective important bird area caretakers in our network library. Um, if you are a member club of Nature Alberta, that member um, network library link is in the member club manual. And it's also the link to the IBA caretaker um, materials is on our website. If you go to naturealberta.ca volunteer, this important bird area caretaker um, list here is always there. Sometimes it's on the second page, but you can click on it and then it'll pop up like this with a picture of me. <laughs> and there's a little dot here that says click, click here to access several resources. So there's resources in, in there um, for you to view. And this is what the network library folder looks like. So it has um, a number of different resources for you to review including the eBird IBA inventory um, protocol that you use to submit your eBird lists. 
there's um, a list of assigned IBA caretakers. So you can see just by looking at it here, we still have lots of areas that don't have someone specifically um, volunteering for the program to monitor that area. And we also have the IBA caretaker mo um, manual that was made quite a while ago. Um, and it does say in there that um, detailed report forms are available for the IBA on the IBA website. And those detailed report forms are 13 pages long. And that's actually not what we we need submitted at this time for um, IBA caretakers. What's most effective um, for the use of our time is submitting those birding lists on eBird. And also if you are keen on um, on monitoring other species as well within the IBA is adding those observations on iNaturalist as well. And so that makes the um, observations automatically accessible to researchers um, in the province that are using that information. So that's kind of the best way to get that species data um, in a usable format for many different ways. Um, sorry, I should mention here that uh, we have a great resource on Nature Alberta's website. If you're new to citizen science, you can go to naturealberta.ca slash citizen science. And there's information on getting started with eBird and also getting started with iNaturalist. So maybe you're a keen eBird user, but you're just starting to figure out or interested in um, marking squirrel and, and grass species, then iNaturalist is the best place to do that. And so we have lots of resources on our website um, to learn those resources as well and access that. Something I wanted to mention here is um, our Franklin's Ground Squirrel project. Um, we've been partnering with McEwen University to raise awareness for the Franklin's ground squirrels. So I wanted everyone to, to know wherever you are in the province, any squirrels that you see in the province, um, we're wanting you to upload those observations onto iNaturalist to help us get an idea of where people are adding squirrel observations onto iNaturalist to help us get an idea of how well we know where the Franklin's ground squirrels are. And also, if you see a Franklin's ground squirrel, obviously to add that observation onto iNaturalist. Um, the Franklin's ground squirrel seems to be disappearing in areas um, that they once were. And so we're hoping to confirm that. And uh, currently, the Franklin's ground squirrel is listed as data deficient. So there's nothing that can be kind of put into place to help conserve the species until we have that data. So we're trying to collect that data right now. So that's what the Franklin's Ground Squirrel Project is all about. So anyone who can help with that is greatly appreciated. Um, I, the other thing that I really would like um, from our important bird and biodiversity area caretakers is to submit your volunteer hours. It, to be included in our annual totals, you can see here that we had um, from last year's numbers, 128 volunteers um, contributed 2,800 hours to our volunteer initiatives. And you can see here, um, let me use my mouse, 232 hours were uh, recorded for citizen science, including important bird area caretakers. And I think that's probably missing quite a few hours there actually. So um, today after after you end the call today, just send me an estimate of how much time you think um, that you've been surveying this fall and or next spring those birds out there. So I can add that to our numbers so we can see the impact that you're having out there. So um, we also uh, have a monthly volunteer email that goes out the volunteer dispatch. Um, Kathu is here today. She's the one that coordinates that and sends that out. Um, Kathu, if you just want to pop off mute for a moment and and say hi to everybody. Yeah. Hello, everyone. So yeah, I'm the first behind the volunteer dispatch. If any of you would like to uh, receive the volunteer dispatch monthly updates about volunteer opportunities with Nature Alberta, just uh, drop an email to naturekids at naturealberta.ca and I can add you to the volunteer dispatch as well. Thank you.
Perfect. Thank you, Kathy. Yeah. And she, uh, Kathy sends out wonderful kind of um, thanks each month, as well as at the end of the year, she recently sent out kind of like a, an overall impact of, of what all our volunteers are doing. So it really helps bring you into the team fold and help you feel like a part of the family and contributing to nature, Alberta. So it's a, it's a great way to stay connected um, with, with us as well. Um, yeah. And another way that I can support your um, volunteer volunteering out on the land is um, giving advice or support and, and um, hearing about things that are happening on the land. So here's a picture actually that Mark had sent me. Mark went out to the migratory bird sanctuary and had saw that there, the fence had been cut and vandalized and an off-highway vehicle had accessed the land um, where it clearly states on this sign that's broken here too, that it's foot access only. Um, so I asked Mark to contact the appropriate Alberta government contact there, and he did. And the next time he came out to the land, the fence was fixed. And so um, that's kind of an amazing immediate impact. And, and Mark, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the fence was then cut again thereafter and then fixed again. And really that process and reporting it right away. No, not and quite, I... Stephanie. No, okay. Actually, sorry, and maybe it's just a misspeak, but it's Monistic Bird Sanctuary. What, it's called... what did I the call it? The area is called Monistic Bird Sanctuary. Okay. <laughs> yes. Thank migratory you. Bird Sanctuary. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It is a my. Okay. No, I haven't been it's out again monistic. since it was fixed. No, I was oh, out okay. in September and October and it was damaged. So the first photograph was from one of those occasions. And then uh, in early November, I was just doing a drive around. It, wasn't too much, it was mostly frozen up everywhere, as you can see. So when I was out in early November, it was it had been fixed. So this was taken in early November. I haven't been out since then, so I don't know if it's been damaged again. But no, it was it was fixed as of this date, which was early November. Wonderful. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, so um, that's kind of a, an example of, of an impact that, that helped. And certainly the, um, the fish and wildlife aren't out there everywhere all at once. So having Mark um, report that right away helped them identify an area that needed attention and it was fixed um, thanks to those extra eyes on the land. Um, I'm also really always excited to hear any reports of um, bird sightings that excited you and and anything like that. That always makes my day to receive an e uh, email summary of an IBA caretaker that went out to, to one of the um, important bird and biodiversity areas and saw something that was special or exciting. So I'm always happy to receive those updates. So before we hand things over to Molly, does anyone have any questions about the, the um, Nature Alberta IBA process oversight? Um, if not, I can hand it straight over to Molly here. I don't see any questions unless someone's in the chat. I can't see the chat right now, I don't think. I think we're good. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing and I'll let Molly share. Let me double check the settings are going to let you. Oops. Oh, it yeah. seems like I'm Should able to. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Steph. Uh, let me just get this into a presenter mode real quick. Yeah. Perfect. And maybe you can tell us a little bit about yourself to start, because I don't have a bio yes. to introduce you. <laughs> Thanks Absolutely. so much, Molly. Um, just to confirm, you can just see the, the slides, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, so my name is Molly Bradford, and I am working with Birds Canada on the Key Biodiversity Areas project. Uh, some of you might have seen me in your email inbox asking you questions about some of your sites, um, but for those of you that I haven't had a chance to speak with yet, it's nice to meet you and see you here today. Um, so my role is sort of helping transition um, important bird and biodiversity areas in Alberta to key biodiversity areas. Uh, and I'm also doing that work in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and British Columbia. So getting to learn a lot about the Western provinces, being that I'm situated in Ontario. 
So it's really nice to connect with local folks like yourselves to sort of get that um, local context about these sites. So um, yeah, today I'm just gonna give sort of a brief overview and general update on the status of a lot of our sites in Alberta so far and introduce sort of this KVA um, project and program a little bit more. So as that many of you are caretakers, I'm not sure if there's other sort of volunteers here as well. I'll just do a really quick intro um, of the IVA program in Canada. Um, so this map that you see here is all of the IVAs that we have across Canada. Um, so these are sites identified for their importance to birds. Um, and why did we do this? Um, so having these areas identified helps to monitor IBAs for population trends of different species and also helps sort of identify and highlight areas that we'd like to conserve when possible and protect as well. And how does all this happen? Um, IBA coordinators like Steph in Alberta and we have other coordinators across the country and then also that caretaker network um, and volunteers working in all of these sites is super critical to maintaining um, these sort of databases in these areas. So the Key Biodiversity Area Project, or KBAs, as I'll kind of be referring to them as throughout the rest of the talk, um, these are really similar to the concept of IBAs, but they sort of take a more holistic approach. So including um, additional species, not just birds, um, as well as ecosystems, they can also be used to designate these sites. So as you can see on this map, um, the blue areas are existing IBAs that we're reevaluating um, under KBA criteria. And then these pink areas are also proposed additional KBAs. So we've really um, expanded um, the, these sites um, into a lot more areas across the country. There are a lot of organizations involved in the KBA project at the national and the global scale. Um, in Canada, the sort of main organizations involved in the identification process um, is ourselves at Birds Canada, and then Wildlife Conservation Society of Canada, and Nature Serve Canada, who has sort of played a key role in helping maintain a KBA database with all of our species observations. Um, so folks at WCS Canada are working on identifying new KBAs for species, anything from, you know, caribou to frogs to lichen and rare plants. Um, so in new areas in Canada, as well as looking for those things within existing IBAs. And then us at Birds Canada are working on um, reevaluating our current IBAs under this new sort of KBA criteria that I'll, I'll get more into. So like I said, this IBA to KBA transition um, is really just about reassessing species from the original IBA designation since that happened quite a long time ago. Um, so, you know, are they still present? Are they still present at the same population? Has it raised? Has it lowered? Are there new species that are important, be they um, other birds or non-birds? Um, so how have we been doing this? Well, um, Birds Canada has a really big data warehouse called Nature Counts. So that includes things from eBird, like all of the IBA protocols that you submit, um, Christmas bird counts, government data sets, marsh monitoring, atlas data, um, tons of records. So that has been really crucial in sort of helping highlight what areas are still important for what species across Canada. Um, and we've also updated all of the national and global population estimates we have for these species, just to make sure we're comparing these site level estimates to the most accurate and recent um, national and global population estimates for all of these species. So I won't get into detail on the criteria, but just sort of give a general idea of how we decide what's important. Um, so the criteria used for KBAs is really similar to what we used for IBAs, which was um, aggregations of species and threatened species. Um, so aggregations um, is our D1 criteria. So essentially what that means is if a site has more than 1% of the national or the global population of a species over a season or, you know, during a key life stage, um, it could be it could qualify under KBA criteria as a, a significant aggregation. So for example, you know, having 3000 tundra swans staging uh, Peace Athabasca Delta during their spring migration, 
you know, for five years in the last 12 years, that would be something that we consider to be a significant aggregation of that species. And then we also have sites that we're designating for birds that are threatened in Canada. Um, so endangered or threatened species under COSEWIC um, can be designated um, for national key biodiversity areas. Um, and the threshold for these species is a lot lower just because of their status. Um, so sometimes you'd only need 0.1% of the national population. And then also supporting that with evidence that there are at least five or 10 reproductive units of that species there just to make sure um, the counts are accurate and it's actually a really important area for that species. So um, I have a couple examples up here, but what that might look like is, you know, 10 burrows of burrowing owl were counted in the Suffield IBA. So that way we know, you know, there's at least 10 reproductive units of that species there. Um, it's a really important area because the population is so low. So that's definitely, you know, a key biodiversity area for burrowing owl. Um, the KBA program has also added additional criteria that wasn't present during the IBA program. So um, the criteria A that we use for threatened species can also be used for threatened ecosystem types. Um, there's also criteria B, which is for species or ecosystems that are you know, geographically restricted within Canada, so only found in um, a small area of the country. And then there's also um, sites for ecological integrity or irreplaceability. Um, we haven't adopted those at the national level yet, so there's none in Canada, but they are working on that um, globally. So um, this is all of the sites within Alberta. Um, so right now there are 47 um, existing IBAs within the province. So in our initial assessments, pulling all that data for nature counts and seeing you know, what recent numbers do we have, there are 18 that are currently still um, just IBAs. So that's not to say they're not you know, important for species. They just haven't met those sort of rigid KBA thresholds with those that 1% or those five reproductive units that I was talking about. Uh, we have two sites that have been officially accepted. They've gone through a really large review process and they're available on our, our KBA Canada website. And then there are 27 that are still candidates that we're still sort of um, working on. So our two accepted sites are Peace Athabasca Delta and Frank Lake South. Um, so these have sort of, as you can see, you know, uh, Peace Athabasca was originally an IBA for waterfowl, was sort of very general. Um, and now in finding new data and speaking with um, reviewers, it's a KBA for American Widgeon, Bucklehead, Canvasback, Shovelers, um, Redheads, and Tundra Swans. So we've been able to sort of add more detail and have a lot stronger data to help support this site. And then we also have sort of within our candidates, some that we're very confident about um, based on, you know, reviewers we've added to and data that we've found. So we have Cardinal Lake um, for, uh, I think it's molting area for Barrow's Golden Eye, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Lesser Save Lake and Lac La Biche had significant Western grebe counts recently um, by Alberta Environment and Protected Areas. Um, there's Beaver Hill Lake up near Edmonton, um, and then in the southern area of the province, Dowling and Shane Lakes were formerly two IBAs that we've merged into one KBA, um, and since they were both being recognized for um, as significant nesting areas for piping plovers. And then also in the south, we have Lake Newell and Kitsum Reservoir um, for its large concentrations of black-bellied plovers. Um, Suffield for burrowing owl and other grassland birds. And then we have Sage Creek, Pataukee Lake, and Milk River in that southeast corner um, for grassland species as well. And um, the sites that I've highlighted in red all have caretakers just to sort of highlight that. So I'll kind of use these three sites as an example of what our process looks like when we're sort of transitioning an IBA to a KBA. So this very blurry photo is the original IBA boundaries of um, those three sites in the southeast corner of Alberta. So we have Sage Creek, which was originally an IBA for burrowing owl, greater sage grouse, uh, mountain plovers, sage thrashers, and Sprague's pipit. 
and then Pakowki Lake here, which was for Franklin's gull, long-billed dowitchers, and water birds. And then Milk River Canyon, which was for mountain plovers, um, chestnut colored long spurs, and sprags pipit. So this is what they used to look like. And then, um, so this is what the reassessment process has looked like. So in this process, we've been able to add um, new species to sites as well as remove species that are no longer relevant. So for example, um, in speaking with experts and looking through the data, we've been told that, you know, burrowing owl as a trigger in Sage Creek isn't really realistic anymore. Um, similarly, mountain plovers aren't found in high enough numbers in Milk River. Um, but we have also been able to add species, like I said, so we were able to use new data that helps support the addition of several grassland species to these sites. Um, so we used um, extrapolated species density models from folks at Environment Canada, which was able to add chestnut colored longspur, Sprague's pipit, lark bunting, and uh, thick billed longspur to some of these sites. Um, now, these species are really hard to survey at threshold numbers, so that sort of 1% or that 0.5% of the population. Using point counts, it would be really challenging to get those values, um, despite knowing that, you know, they're present in this, this great grassland habitat. Um, so this KBA reevaluation process allowed us to explore new types of data, like modeling, uh, which is going to help designate these areas for rare birds in Alberta, which is great. Um, so while assessing these bird populations, our colleagues at Wildlife Conservation Society have assessed these areas for um, additional species. So we have things like swift fox, um, great shorthorn lizard, soapweed, smooth goosefoot, um, some lichen being added to these sites. So lots of biodiversity being added here, um, which is awesome to see again. Um, so in adding these new species, it also meant that we wanted to sort of reassess the boundaries of these sites, make them as accurate and representative as possible. So, for example, we have Kelki Lake, we've extended um, down south to include more grassland and sandhill habitat to help reflect those new species that were added. Um, Sage Creek has sort of been adjusted to better follow the native grassland habitat. And we've also tried to follow Alberta township sections when possible to try and avoid the amount of you know, cropland or private land that we're including in these areas and make sure it's it's the habitat that's being used by all of the species. Um, and so in doing that, we've also changed some of the names to better reflect things as well. So lots of updates and lots of changes to make sure these sites are as representative of the current situation as possible. So these three are um, relatively close to acceptance. They need to go through um, what's called general review, so chatting with more experts, but they have already, you know, undergone technical review, and we've chatted with experts along the way, um, as well as the caretaker from an adjacent Saskatchewan site, to make sure um, that local people with the actual knowledge of the sites are being consulted along the way as much as possible. And then we also have a couple sites that, um, you know, we're likely to find data for. We hope that it's out there. It's just about finding the right people to talk to with the right data, which can be challenging sometimes. Um, so that's Yutukuma, Yutukumasis Lakes, and Kimawan Lake. And then we have a long list of sites that are um, maybe candidates if we're able to um, do surveys. So I know I've chatted with Mark about this before, but a lot of these areas are, you know, large and it's really hard to get a group of volunteers together to do fulsome surveys. Um, so some of these sites, you know, we're confident that the numbers could be reached. It's just about coordinating those efforts. Um, but if you're the caretaker of any of these sites and you maybe have data that I'm not aware of or have any ideas of how, what species might be able to be reached at this site, feel free to contact me. I'll have my all my information on the final slide as well. There Sorry, Molly, there is a okay. caretaker for the mystic Joseph and Oliver Lake. It's because I'm the caretaker. Oh, of course you are. That's an oversight on my part. Thanks, Mark. And I know I've spoken to you about all of those. <laughs> can we ask other questions at the end, or can I jump in one now for your last slide? Um, you... what I, I'm, I'm okay with, with either. If you have a question Just now. Just an overall question. Can... You appear to be saying that boundaries could be changed. 
is, did I hear that correctly? Yeah, so we're we're very open to um, right. changing boundaries to make them as reflective of the current, you know, situation as possible. Okay, it's just the only one. Um, it's Mickelon Lake, I think about because, for example, if Mickelon Lake was changed to include all three basins of Mickelon Lake, that might help. It's actually mm -hmm. three basins, and only. Only one of them's within that boundary that shows on the IBA maps. Anyway, I think I mentioned to you that when we chatted that if we can change boundaries, that might be better for the Nicolon Lake one anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. That's definitely, I know we remember chatting about that and I do have that on my radar. So it's, we're open to changing boundaries if, you know, it's important. We sort of try and stay away from extending just to sort of meet thresholds. But like you said, you know, having all the basins included would be relevant to the site name. So that's something that could be doable if, if the species are there. Um, so yeah, those were our maybes. And then we have some that we've assessed as um, likely not candidates just based on um, chatting with experts and um, reviewing that the data that's available to us. So um, quite a few piping plover sites, unfortunately, um, likely won't move forward as KBAs, but will remain as IBAs. Um, and this, a lot of these is just because water levels have been, you know, too low at these lakes for too many consecutive years to keep supporting um, significant populations of piping plovers. So that's unfortunate, but, you know, they could always come back. So it's not sort of out of the question entirely. And then there's other ones for other word species that have also been assessed as likely not candidates. Um, and some of those have caretakers and some don't. Um, so I wanna stress that, you know, these sites are still, it's not to say that these aren't biodiverse or critical habitat for species. They just haven't met that sort of rigid KBA criteria. And then there's a few that we just haven't uh, had a chance to assess yet. So they are CBD. <laughs> Um, so how caretakers can help, um, one way is providing technical review of the sites, um, which I'll actually walk through the Google form that we, we share um, with everyone just to kind of show you what we're looking for. Um, sharing contacts uh, that might be helpful for data or, um, you know, species assessments, and then contributing data. So continuing um, to submit on eBird through your IBA protocol, and then I'll also um, share my screen with the new iNaturalist project just to sort of show you what that looks like as well. So I will switch my screen sharing here. I might have to stop and then share again. Okay, can everyone see this map? Perfect, okay. I'll just quickly walk through the technical review form. So this is our map with all of the candidate sites. So I probably have shared this with a lot of you. Um, so let's say I'm the caretaker for Grand Prairie and I want to see you know, what species are at the site. I wanna read a little bit about the site information. Uh, and then after doing that, I want to submit some comments about the site. So you click review site. And then there will just be some brief contact information. Excuse all the spelling mistakes I'm going to make doing this quickly. Um, and then it'll ask, it'll say, you know, your site's currently an IBA or it's currently a KBA. And then it'll ask, do you think the site should be a KBA? And maybe you think, you know what? Yeah, I think this should be a KBA. It's a big area, it's an important area. Um, are there any significant trigger species missing from this site? And I think, you know what, it's called the trumpeter swan IBA. There's no trumpeter swan data. I think that trumpeter swan should be at this site. Um, and then are there any observations that no longer make sense? Maybe I also think that, you know, there's that one year of Western Grebe that met thresholds, but that was sort of a, a one-off, you know, there's not usually numbers that high. So I'd make a comment about that as well. Are there any species listed as vagrants or one-offs? I kind of addressed that with the Western breed. So, you know, maybe you click no, I already said that. 
Um, do I know of any data that might have significant observations? Maybe I do, you know, um, need species count, um, coordinator, X name could be reached here. Um, they have additional data for this site. Uh, and then it also asks you to look at the boundaries. So maybe you take a look and you think, you know what, all the important areas are included. Or like Mark said with Miquelon, you know, we're missing one of the basins. So that could be a comment that you you include here as well. And then also asks about the site summary. So if you want to suggest any changes about that, like, um, you know, conservation efforts are out of date, um, X project didn't happen. Um, just sort of small updates like that are, are really helpful. Um, so that's on, that's all of it. Um, it's super quick, it's super easy, um, especially if you know a lot about the site, like you do about your own sites that you caretake. Um, and that really helps us quite a bit. Um, and then I'll just briefly touch on the iNaturalist project. Um, so I wanna stress first that the iNaturalist project is completely optional. Um, I know that you're IBA caretakers, so obviously we all love birds here. Um, and if other species aren't your forte, that's completely fine. But if you know you love rare plants and you wanna be contributing those observations as well, that's fantastic. Um, so this project has all of our sites that are accepted. So they've gone through all that review. Um, so for Alberta, we have Frank Lake and Peace Athabasca. So if I go to the Frank Lake page, it tells us a little bit about the site up here and shows us the recent observations. And then we can go down here and it has those um, IBA, KBA boundaries. And if you zoom in, you can see all of the different species that have been reported. So blue is birds, there's a lot of birds, but you know, we also have red glass wart and uh, red legged grasshopper. So it can kind of help highlight that, you know, additional biodiversity at these sites. So if that's something you're interested in, all you have to do is any record that you submit that falls within um, this boundary will automatically be added to um, the site page, which is great. Um, and Stephanie did mention the caretaker manual. Um, right now it doesn't include information about um, this project, but I believe in the near future, it's going to be updated to include a little more information about the iNaturalist work and some suggestions for monitoring other species as well. And that is all from me, and I welcome any questions from everybody. Let me just end the recording here.